Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person, Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I have hosted First Person since it began at the museum in 2000. We are in our 25th year. Each month, we share firsthand accounts of survival during the Holocaust. Each of our First Person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Ruth Cohen share her firsthand account of the Holocaust with us. Ruth, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person. Welcome. You're welcome. Ruth, I know you just have so much to share with us in our short one hour, so we'll get started right away. Ruth, you were born April 26, 1930, in Mukachevo, Czechoslovakia, in present-day Ukraine. Before we turn to your early life, World War II and the Holocaust, please tell us about your parents, Herman and Bertha, and their lives prior to your birth. My uh, parents married about a year and a half before I was born. My mother came from Slovakia. My father came from Czechoslovakia, from Mukachevo. Uh, my mother moved to Ushorod, which is, I'm not sure how many miles away from Mukacha, but she lived there until they um, met, and I don't know how they met. My dad was a um, businessman. He manufactured, he and his brother manufactured wine, with uh, a liqueur, and sold beer. Wholesale, bottled and sold it. Other than that, they, I was a Catholic. Ruth, your parents were well educated. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, actually, my father was educated uh, um, professionally. My mother was not. Girls at the time, at the time where my mother lived. Girls were not formally educated, but she was always reading, always studying. I suppose she copied her brothers, who were all professionals. Um, and, and she was as if she had a very, very high degree of education. Mm -hmm. So pretty much self-educated from that standpoint. It Absolutely like. self-educated. Yeah. From, you, I think he's great. You, you, you mentioned a little bit about your father's wholesale business. Um, tell us a little bit more about it. Um, who, who were the customers? Well, the customers were wholesale businesses. Mm -hmm. But on Friday afternoon, uh, my sister, my brother, and I were helping out in refilling bottles, uh, wine bottles for Jews who were observing Shabbat dinner and used it for, to make Kiddush mostly. So you had the job of helping to fill the bottles when they came on Fridays. Right. And that was in my grandfather's and my father's uh, business cellar. <laughs> Ruth, um, your father had been previously married and had a daughter, Teresa, whom your parents raised. Tell us about Teresa. Teresa was raised by my mother and father after she was seven. Before that, she was raised by my grandmother and my other aunts who every month came to visit, took turns visiting and helped my grandmother raise her. I must say that it left some scars on her, mm -hmm. but... Um, as far as I was concerned, she was my older sister. She was great. She, uh, to me, she uh, sort of saved my life in Auschwitz. And uh, then 
when we came home from Auschwitz, she, um, I'm not sure that she continued her education, but she certainly was able to take a position in her office mm-hmm. and work. Um, I don't know at what level. And she did that until the time she left uh, Czechoslovakia. And, and Ruth, one more question before we move on from the, the, those early years. Your parents were li- religious. Can you say more about that? Well, they were very religious. Now we would call them um, on the modern Orthodox side, but at that time it was it was deeper than that. Um, and they were Zionists, both of them. Perhaps my grandfather too. I'm not sure. Um, my mother was president of several, uh, not Jewish, but Zionist organizations in our town. And highly revered because of that and because of what she was. Mm-hmm. And my dad was my dad. Mm-hmm. Ruth, um, you were born in 1930. What do you remember about your, your early years? Of course, one of the things you remembered was helping out in your father's business on Fridays. But what else do you recall from your early years? Well, this picture is taken across the street from our house. It's a huge piece of land with a house in the middle of it where my best friend lived. First of all, we played soccer in their front yard, which was huge. Every, every time we came home from school, we, meaning the children in the neighborhood, went there and played soccer, did our homework after that. Um, I can also say that every Friday afternoon, because our school was has ended and we were home by one o'clock, I had to help our housekeeper with preparing for Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had to help scrub some chairs, uh, perhaps with some cooking. It was our job to do that. Mm -hmm. Other than that, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to ask you what you can tell us about this photo. Well, I did before. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, This photo is one of a time when I, when we received a present from the United States, from New York, with a football, of a football and some sort of a toy for my brother. So each time we received a package, my mother put our best clothes on, and we had to go probably always to this spot and take a picture and send it off to uh, New York to my family. And I can't help but noting that while you played soccer, that's an American football in that photograph that right. made you. But that's what it is. Yep. All right. We'll, we, we'll use that. Yes. Ruth, tell us a little bit about your little brother, Ari. Well, I could talk about him for a long time, but okay. he was um, he was adorable. He was also a very a wonderful little boy. He was very very, very bright. Something really funny I can say about him, aside from everything else, he was also he was a sportsman, whatever. I mean, he was an excellent student, in school, excellent student. In the Cheder, the funny thing that I want to mention is that he um, would be very anxious to do everything perfectly. And uh, we had to learn all the poems by heart, absolutely by heart. So at night, my mother would say to him, okay, you have studied enough. Now put the book under your pillow and tomorrow morning you know it. And sure enough, he knew it. But He knew it by morning. Right, because he studied it before and he knew it. Wow. It was really funny. We always made fun of him for that. Ruth, you, you had a large extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins. Would you share a little about your family, the extended family? Well, my my father's family lived in Mukachevo, some of it lived in Mukachevo, and most of it lived in nearby towns, not very nearby, maybe 50 miles away, 150 miles, 
30, and one maybe a little more, I'm not certain. They, the daughters came to visit once a month. Um, they supposedly visited my grandmother and grandfather, and they always spent at least about a week in each, no in each, but in each time um, with my grandmother, my, my grandparents. When my grandfather died, my grandmother moved to our house and they spent their week in our house, which very often caused friction between my sister and uh, mm -hmm. not myself as much as my yeah. mother, because everything was always blamed by my mother, I have to say that. Ruth, your family spoke several languages. Will you tell us about that? Sure. It's not our family, but everybody in the area. Outside of um, uh, Hebrew, which we also spoke, everybody spoke four or five languages. Mm. So it was, at first it was Czech, and then changed to Hungarian, German, German and German, Hungarian, and Hebrew were really the family house. Old languages. Mm -hmm. The others came when we needed, whenever we needed to understand even Russian or um, the Ukrainian language. We understood it, we spoke it, but not perfectly. It wasn't your daily language. Yeah. No, but the others were. Yeah. Do you recall if you or members of your family experienced? any anti-Semitism in your early years? I have to say no. We did not. We lived in an area kind of half and half. And um, there was no one that ever mm -hmm. made me aware of anti-Semitism except a little later on, a little, a little later, maybe in 41, 42, one of my friends did not go to my school, and she sometimes talked about it, but not really. We, we, did, not, we did not understand what that was at, at the time. At the time, yeah. If Ruth I also did not, I did not mention my mom's family, who lived all over Czechoslovakia and Hungary, and came, the men came to visit us also around once every two months. So our house was always not full, but welcoming family members and was always wonderful, except when some of my aunts had some trouble. Ruth, from, from 1938 to 1939, Nazi Germany dismantled Czechoslovakia. In 1938, Mukachevo and other nearby communities became part of Hungary. You were just eight years old at the time. What happened to your family now that your hometown was part of Hungary? The very first thing that happened was that my school was changed from a co-ed classroom, not a co-ed school, a co-ed classroom, to each um, men, boys and girls had to be in separate classes with the curriculum being exactly the same, um, except for Czech was changed to Hungarian, everything else remained the same. Other than that, my dad's business was taken away from him. He had to um, train the man who they brought from Budapest to carry on with business activities. I have no idea what the situation was. Uh, salary-wise or income-wise, it was never discussed in the house. So I didn't. They, but they literally took the business from him and had took somebody else and brought him in and had them now own the business. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With my aunt and uh, uncle and, and dad um, training them. Training them. Because mm -hmm. they probably knew nothing about the business. No, came in. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Ruth, you, you had a nanny when you were young. Uh, but she left at that time. Please tell us about her and why she left. Well, 
aside from the fact that she was wonderful, she received a letter on two days, three days perhaps after March 8th, I think, when uh, Mukacheva became Hungary, that she must go home. She's not allowed to work for Jews. So we um, all spent the day crying, or maybe two days. And that means herself, my family, kids, everyone. And um, she left, and we missed her terribly. And that was that? That was it. Yeah. In, in 1942, your mother learned that some of her family members in Slovakia had been deported to the Majdanek um, concentration camp in German occupied Poland. Please tell us what your mother learned and, and how this affected your family. Well, my, my mother's um, young, not youngest, but the next youngest brother uh, lived in Slovakia in a city, a village called Ermi, where he um, was a rabbi, but not with a congregation. He was a rabbi, he was constantly studying. Had a wife and three little girls. And in Hlohovets, in another town, lived my mother's sister. All of them were taken to Majdanek. And we got, I don't know how, but we got a report of the fact that she was, they were killed, all of them. Um, my mother immediately took her wig off, which she wore, uh, because of our religion, our religious beliefs, and um, never put it back on again. The whole family um, had to go into deep mourning, such as not listen to music for about a year. Then we did not go to movies, to theater, to concerts at all. That All was. as part of this deep mourning that your family was going through. Yes. Yeah. Two, two of your young cousins, Leo and Esti from Slovakia, came, came to live with you. Can you tell us about that? Well, the aunt that was taken to Majdanek had a daughter who was married and had three children, two boys and a girl. When things were getting a little rough in Slovakia, more so than in Hungary, mm -hmm. um, my uh, family decided that they wanted to adopt these two, adopt their children to save them in case everybody would be taken away from Slovakia. Because Hungary at that point was not losing its Jews yet. Right. Um, my cousins did not want to give up all their children, but they did give up two. So the oldest one stayed with them, hoping that hoping that they are going to we are going to survive and they, they may not. Mm -hmm. so we got Leo and SD. Leo was ten and SD was nine, eight and a half, nine. Two. They adopted my parents adopted them. They came to live with us. Also, very sweet, wonderful, very pretty children. And we, we treated them as if they were our sister and brother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Several other family members, um, your uncle Moritz and your husband, uh, cousin Hedvig, who were in Slovakia, were hiding Jews. What do you know about what they did and about what happened to them? Well, um, Hedwig was the mother of these two children who we adopted. Okay. Uh, they, she and her husband, his name was Freddy, uh, uh, saved, I think, about 40 people, but I don't know where. It could mm -hmm. have been more, uh, but I don't know how and where they saved them, but they did. Um, which we learned from some of the survivors, actually. Mm -hmm. My uncle Moritz saved about 150 children, 125 people uh, in this building that was part of this, this uh, uh, synagogue, in the attic and in his apartment 
in the attic. In a November of 1944, both of them were ratted out by the people in both towns who were actually aware of what was happening and were getting paid from both my uncle and my cousin that um, to help to help them save these people. I don't know what happened, what made them rat them out, rat them out, actually. I don't know. But they had done incredible work by hiding those numbers of other Jews. And when they were ratted out, I'm sorry, when they were ratted out, they were taken to Auschwitz. Yeah. My aunt with, my uncle with my aunt, and my uh, cousin with her one child and her uh, husband were taken to Auschwitz. I don't exactly know what happened to my cousins, but my uncle, because my aunt survived, she told us that my uncle and she were on the death march in Auschwitz, mm -hmm. I suppose around December, maybe January. And um, he didn't even have to go, but he went because everybody else went and he couldn't take it. He just collapsed and died. Ruth, in the photo we just had, I just, if we could go back for just a moment, who's, who, tell us who's circled here. The uh, young man with the hat is my cousin who went to um, England in 1939. He became part of the, uh, I think it was called the British Brigade. That was actually an Israeli brigade. Mm -hmm. And um, he ended up either in Greece, I'm not sure, my other cousin ended up in Greece, I'm not sure that he was there, and then he went back to Israel and became a um, high official in the army, in the Israeli army. My uncle is the one I just talked about. Yeah. There, there was a young woman and others who came to your town from Poland and they talked about terrible things that were being done to Jews in Poland. What did what do you know of what she told you? Well, at one point, I was either 41 or 42, 40, 41, 42. Uh, a whole group of young ladies came over from Poland. And many of us, many Jewish families, housed them. The ones that were at our house told us about the horrors that they ran away from because people were having to dig their own grave, dig their own graves, stand right next to them and shot and poured into the graves. And um, they wanted to avoid it, I suppose, and they did while they were at our house, but I have no idea what happened to them. Just none. I never heard about them. My family never heard about them again. And Ruth, you shared with me when they when they came and told you about these horrific things. It was it was hard to believe it, wasn't it? Well, of course. Yeah. Because it, it, it was not something normal for us to either experience or other people to experience such I things. So no, we didn't. But eventually, we had to. Yeah. In. In, and to move into those times now, in March 1944, Nazi Germany invaded and occupied Hungary. As bad as things had been for your family and other Jews in Hungary, it immediately became far worse. Within a month, your family was forced from your home and into a transit ghetto. What do you recall about the Germans coming into Mukachevo? Mostly, I remember, is the awful racket early in the morning on that same morning when they came in with the tanks and motorcycles and just drove all over the city it wasn't a tiny city it was a it was a city of at that time of 45 or so thousand people mm -hmm. uh, it was awful you, you weren't in the ghetto that they made you go into this transit ghetto very long before you were forced into freight cars. Please tell us what you remember 
um, about being moved out of the ghetto? Moving out of the ghetto, I remember nothing. I remember knowing that we had to pack a few things. My parents had to pack a few, a few pots, a few, a few uh, dishes, some food, our clothing, and uh, leave. That's all. And after that, I have absolutely no memory of what happened until we left that ghetto. Until you left the ghetto, but you, you, the clothes that you were you were able to pack. I, I was struck by you sharing with me that you actually put on many layers of clothes. Well, this was just before Pesach. And I don't know whether everybody else, but certainly our family received new clothing before Pesach and before Rosh Hashanah. So I know that I had three dresses that had been made for me. I had brand new shoes. Um, about an inch high um, heels, because before that I wore like a half an inch or even even lower. Um, And because it was my 14th birthday, Mm -hmm. I had the best, most fantastic present, and there were silk stockings. That's what we wore. That's That's what what I wore. wore. Yes. Mm -hmm. When, when you were taken from there to the freight cars, who was with you? My family and my extended family. Mm-hmm. Because, first of all, this ghetto was in one of the extended families' uh, uh, house, housing. I don't even know what to call it. Uh, there were several little houses, tiny ones, and we lived in one of them, and it was there. Then there was their big house. Yeah. They had lots of kids, and uh, I suppose that they each had a little house. I'm not sure. Yeah. And and when you were all with all your family, you were taken to the freight cars. You So you saw people all around you who you knew, including one of your teachers. Right. What ha- Tell us what happened to her that you witnessed. That I witnessed and everybody else. She was a remarkable person. Um, Almost everybody adored her, and I certainly did. And she was the kind of person who said, no, I'm not going to do what I'm told to do. I'm not going to go up on those steps and get into those uh, uh, bar- uh, train tra- trains. So she sat down on the first step, and she was killed right away. She was shot right away, and she was left there for all of us to see, all her students, all her Students, families, it was terrible, awful. And you're 14 years old. Yeah, and one of the one of the worst things in my existence at that time and a little later was. When when that happened um, and you were forced onto those trains, Ruth, did did you know? Did you have any idea where you were going? No. No. We nobody knew. If my parents did, and I don't think they did, but if yeah. they did, they never said a word. And so after four days of traveling in the freight cars, you arrived at the Auschwitz-Birkenau Killing Center. Please tell us what happened to you and your family when you arrived at Auschwitz. I'd like to mention the fact that we had very little food, Mm -hmm. none that we received from the Germans, and absolutely no water. For four days. For four days. They gave us no water just to torture us. That, that we were absolutely afraid of because people cried for water and they weren't getting it. Mm-hmm. So when we got to Auschwitz, um, we saw a lot of people, a lot of um, people in stri- striped clothing, which, was, which were the Jewish um, prisoners. We saw some German officers and a lot of people on the other side. I guess we had to line up with the people on the other side where we were. No, I'm sorry. Men were immediately uh, uh, 
they were separated from you right separated. away, right? Yeah. They were separated, and they were the people on the right right hand side. Uh, we were all females and the children were together. Mm -hmm. We were on the left hand side, and we were marching towards the German officers that we saw. One of them happened to be Mengele. The other one was a woman, but I'm not sure whether it was his girlfriend or not, but right. it might have been. Um, the others were just officers. We, um, my mother and my three siblings were sent to the left. My sister and I were sent to the right. And my dad had already gone sort of away. And um, that's what happened. Ruth, when, when you and your sister were separated from your mother and the, your, your, your siblings and your father had already been taken away, did, when did you learn what happened to them? Um, I don't know how many hours it took, but it was the same day. I have no memory of what happened after we were separated. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, apparently, we women who were separated from the rest of the family were shaved, deloused, washed, and um, got new clothing, the striped clothing, with some shoes, or the wooden shoes. We went to, um, we walked to the barracks that we were to be in for a while, seven months exactly. Uh, and when we entered the barrack that we were going to, a woman ran to my sister. They recognized each other as old friends of five years ago, five years prior to that, who had been to summer camp. And um, and cried and hugged and cried and it was amazing. Anyway, she uh, helped us. First of all, she told us that my mother and siblings are already not alive. Mm -hmm. They are already gassed and taken care of, uh, which we certainly did not believe. It was, it was ridiculously unbelievable as possible. But then she did two things that were great. One, she gave us a cube of sugar, which most of the time in my life, even up to now, somehow the last few weeks did stop. But I, uh, when I think about it, I feel the energy of the sugar going through my veins, which is Kind of unbelievable, but it's a fact. Mm -hmm. To this, to this, to this day, you have felt that all these years. Well, the last few weeks, I haven't. Up, yeah. up to then, I definitely did. Mm -hmm. uh, I never asked my sister whether she did. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And then she provided me with a job, and my sister she hired as hired, not hired, but decided she was going to be her assistant which she was until the end of the time that we were in Auschwitz. And I, I got a wonderful job as a messenger, which was a very well-protected uh, job. And, this and, is I, how I survived. and I'm going to ask you a couple more questions about that in a moment. Before okay. I do, though, the, the barrack that you went to was part of something called Sea Lager. What, what was especially significant about Sea Lager? Yeah, but there was just one barrack of 30 barracks in the city. Right. We were supposed to be killed. I don't know what the plan was, but that's what it was. And therefore, they did not tattoo us. They did not waste money on ink and labor. So we were not tattooed. And Ruth, you, you, as you said, your barrack was one of 30 barracks how many women were in each of those barracks? 1,000. 1,000. Yeah. So 30,000 women in Sea Lager. Right. Yeah. Ruth, you were, you were 14 and Teresa was 21 while you were in Auschwitz. And as you said, 
Miriam gave you this job of being a messenger. Tell us, were there other messengers and what what were you required to do as a messenger? Well, there were very few youngsters like myself. There was one 13-year-old, I think either one 15-year-old or one other 14-year-old, and the others were 15. Altogether, we were about 13 girls. Uh, our job was to stand. Uh, I don't know how the schedule was made, but two or three of us each time were standing by the uh, gate, which had a uh, a little a little office kind of thing for the uh, Nazis. Uh, I think each each one had three Nazis in them, and um, we were outside of it to serve them as they needed to send uh, messages to any one of the 30 uh, bar- uh, barracks in that particular camp. We never got out of that camp. Just had to run from there to anyone, or if anyone called from there, we had to go get the message and bring it to, to the uh, officers. So sending messages back and forth between these 30 barracks and the and the guards' um, uh, shacks that they were in. Right. And, and well, they were not guards. The guards were up around. Okay. Yeah. Well, what was your sister's job? To help Miriam clean and keep the barrack in order. Mm-hmm. Did, did having these jobs, did they offer you any particular advantages? Well, yes, we uh, especially I was kind of saved because of it, because um, I had typhoid fever. I was taken to the infirmary, and when the Nazis came in to select the very weak or the very sick. Uh, the nurses and the doctors hid us. I don't know where they took us, but they took us away and then brought us back when it was over. So we were never selected um, to go to the gas chambers from there. And my and sisters also. She she was saved from being sent to the gas because of the job. Yeah. And, and Ruth, you, you, you shared with me that when you went to the infirmary because you were so ill with, with typhoid fever, that they actually treated you, which was really uncommon. Right. They treated everybody. I don't know with what medication, but we did, did get treated. And uh, I don't know who got better, but I did. Yeah. And, and during this time, you had an encounter with your father. Um, tell us about that. Um, we received, my sister and I received a message. Uh, I have no idea how, I don't know where, what, but we received a message from my dad that we should be at a certain spot by the wire fence and we will see him walk with blankets with other men. So we did that and... Um, Yes, we saw him. He was very, he was carrying blankets. He and other men were carrying blankets. I don't know to where, but um, we managed to wave to him. He waved back and he um, smiled. And of course, we smiled, probably shouted. And and up, up until that point, Ruth, did you, did you even know he was alive? No. No. And another thing is we were looking for my uncle to be with him and we didn't see him. So I don't know whether we decided that he wasn't alive or not, but my sister and I, I remember now, talked about it. And, and speaking of your uncle, if you don't mind, tell us about the message you got from another uncle who was also at Auschwitz. Uh, about a month after we got the message from my dad, this was by now, it was probably July. We got a message from my uncle my mother's youngest brother, who had lived in Brno in Czechoslovakia. Uh, Jews from Brno were taken to Terezin, um, where they stayed for an 
undetermined time. I don't know if it was a day or a month or many months. I don't know. But he uh, sent us a message that he is in now. He is in Auschwitz now, and um, he we should we meet? Could we meet him at another wire fence at four o'clock in the afternoon? So we did, and again we had no idea how these messages happened. Right. He, um, we met him and we talked and probably laughed a lot. Of course, we couldn't touch, but um, he told us that we will uh, see him for a few days, and when we don't, we should know that he has been sent to the gas chambers and killed. And um, about four days later, we went there, and he uh, he wasn't there, but a woman was there who gave with a message from him saying that um, he's no longer alive, and he sent us his love. Mm. And that was, I think, one of the most horrible moments in my life. Mm-hmm. Worse than just about anything else, and it's still thinking about it is unbelievable. To this very day, of course. Yes. yes. Ruth, in, in early October 1944, there was a prisoner revolt at Auschwitz that included prisoners setting fire to one of the crematorium. You were witness to some portion of that. What, what, what do you remember of that? Well, standing by the um, that roof gave us a view of the next camp and the street between us. And all of a sudden we saw two push carts being pushed by four women, two each. The push carts were covered with blankets. We were wondering what that's got, what that was, but they passed our area and then turned uh, left. And we knew that they were going to the uh, crematoria because that's where it was. It was right behind our barrack. Um, and we heard a, a not very large explosion. What happened was the revolt did not uh, succeed because apparently most of some most of the TNT did not explode. There was an explosion, but that was it. However, um, all the gas chambers after that were, no, the crematorium after that were stopped from functioning. Mm-hmm. So that was sort of the end of Auschwitz. Um, from what I know now, didn't know it until recently, is those four women were hung in the middle of Auschwitz, not near us. We didn't see it. I didn't know about it until maybe a month ago. Mm. They were hung. The men who were involved in distributing the TNT were also killed. And the Zonja Commando, who was in charge at the time of this little revolt, were also killed. Um, the other thing that happened is that as they emptied the camp, this was on the 7th of October, they started emptying Auschwitz, sending the prisoners to different um, camps. My sister and I were sent to Nuremberg. Uh, and and to Nuremberg work. was in Germany, right? Yes. So. Working in... Uh, Factory, which I never remember the name of, or hardly ever. Um, we worked there, uh, winding wire on spools for air, airlines. Um, while we were there, uh, something really nice happened to us, and that was. Uh, Four women sat at each table, and when we came in, 
one morning and then several other mornings, um, we found little brown bags on the chairs that we sat on with either a slice of bread, an apple, or both for us. It was really amazing to us that this happened, aside from the fact that we love to eat what we got, right. but that these people were actually taking such terrible chances at getting killed. By or leaving you a piece of bread or an yes, apple. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but they did. And that was that was quite a wonderful thing. Thanks for telling us about that, Ruth. And, and of course, while you were at this camp at Nuremberg, the Allies were constantly bombing it. And, and eventually that camp was, was destroyed. So after the camp was destroyed, you and Teresa were sent to yet another camp, Holyshoff, which was another sub sub camp of the Flossenburg concentration camp. And you were there for about three months and that's where you were liberated from. Please, t please tell us about being liberated from Holy Shove, which I think you also did very similar work helping to build airplane parts. Yeah, it was the same factory. So we same. did the same thing. I was sick shortly after we got there and stayed sick throughout the time. I think I worked for a week, possibly two, but then I had to be in bed because there was just no way I could stand on my legs, my feet, my back was killing me. At any rate, um, then came the end of the war. And um, one Saturday, when we were not working, we noticed men running down a uh, the mountain next to our barrack with open bayonets. They did come down, they opened the gates and actually told us that we were free, but not free to leave the camp. The American soldiers will come to free us in a few days and that it is close to the very end of the war. So these were not Americans. Who were these? They were white Russian partisans. White Russian partisans. Right. Very important. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. They um, locked the barracks, locked the um, camps, and uh, they invited anyone who wanted to go back with them to their camp. Should. My, um, no, uh, uh, about two hours, an hour or two later, and a uh, group of 90 people, 90, 95 people, came back and um, told us that the partisans told them that, asked them who was Jewish, and if whoever is Jewish, they don't want them there, just go back. So, um, I guess anti-Semitism was still there. Yeah, and this was among the liberators, the white Russian partisans, and they, they sent all those people back to the camp. Right. But they, they kept about uh, 25, I think. Yeah. And, were, and those people were uh, political prisoners from Germany, Russia, Poland, Holland, France. So. Mm -hmm. After that, two days later, we were we were um, liberated by the American soldiers, and that was the last day of the war. Yeah, and you said to me that was you really were liberated twice, and the yes. second the second one was was your real liberation. Permanent, right? And and so the Americans came; they liberated you the last day of the war, uh, but they too said not to go out, right? Right, because things were still going on. First of all, some. Not not soldiers, not German soldiers, but German people who are not very much for us were out there hurting people, and we should not go out. And also, they were afraid that some of the women will go out and break into homes and steal things, and they didn't want that to happen. And it didn't happen, not at all. Ruth, you you remained. Uh, with your sister, Teresa, throughout the experience that you've just told us about. 
We have a video question from a student, Kana. Let's go ahead and hear from Kana. Hi, my name is Kana. I'm from Washington, DC. How did you and your sister maintain hope through all you had to experience? Ruth, what Kana asks is, how did you and your sister maintain hope through everything that you experienced? That was the only thing that we had left. Nothing else. Everything mm -hmm. else had been, we have been robbed of. Hope was the only thing that we can hope will help us get out of that situation. And mm -hmm. obviously we did. Well, thank you, Connor, for that question. Yes. Ruth, then, so a after your liberation, you and Teresa made your way home. Tell us how you returned to Mukachevo and, and what you found when you got there. And, yes. and about going there as well, because you were getting messages related to your father, I believe. Right. We got a message from my dad when we passed Prague by train. Um, that he is at home, he was liberated, he's at home, and he's waiting for anyone who survived to come home. And we did. We met him, and we were the only ones who survived with him. Mm -hmm. needless, until... to say, needless to say, it was a glorious moment. Oh, I, absolutely. I can only imagine. But up until that point, Ruth, um, when you reunited with your father or you got the message from him, did you know that you, you must not have known he was alive? No, we had no, no idea. No was... idea, yeah. When you left Auschwitz and went to those two other camps, you were in a great deal of pain. And now that you were back home in Mukachevo with your father and Teresa, you remained in serious pain. And eventually you were diagnosed with tuberculosis of the spine and went to a tuberculosis sanitarium in Slovakia. Tell us what that was like for you. And because you had been in a lot of pain during that whole time. Um, at first, after months of being at home, I could not, I could just not suffer the pain. So my father took me to Budapest to the children's hospital where they they x-rayed me at least three times a day and for 30 days and could find absolutely nothing wrong with me that they could just nothing wrong with me um and having been in bed at bed rest i felt a little better so my dad took me home um this was probably july um, yeah, July, and he um, and I, I started feeling bad again, and very, very much in pain. And so my father got in touch with my aunt in Blahovec in Czechoslovakia, who uh, knew people, doctors, others in the hospital in Bratislava, where um, my mother's best friend was also a doctor. They somehow got me a room, um, but not until March. Now, this and that, was would have been, that would have been March 1946. 46, yes. Yeah. Um, but this was only November. So I had to, um, I stayed with my aunt in bed. She helped me, of course. And then I finally got to the hospital um, where they, again, tested me for about three months and then found that I had, the, I had tuberculosis. And the only, the only thing that they could um, use, do for my um, for my body is to put me into a cast, which was about an inch thick, and it was a half cast that I was lying in. So I was not allowed to walk for about nine months, not to walk, not to sit up. Um, even eat 
lying down, which I'm still doing because of that. And uh, that was, and I did, I did get better. Within nine months, my weight was good. The pus in my back had not continued to accumulate, and I was free to go home. So I ended up in Tatri Mountains, where tubercular people were, patients were being cured, completely cured. And um, I stayed there for, I think, three months. And, and that was that that part of it was actually a good time for you, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. It was. I was feeling great. I did a lot of hiking, mountain climbing, dancing. These people were fantastic. And the young lady in the white was my doctor, and that was me. And that's you there with the others that were there with you, right? Ruth, um, after this long period of hospitalization and recuperation, you and your father came to the United States arriving in April, 1948, with your sister Teresa joining you six months later. What did it take for you to get to the United States and, and how was your adjustment to a whole new life in the U.S. for you? Well, I got here with the help of my sister, I must say. My dad did not speak uh, Czech well enough, but my sister did, and she uh, took care of all the necessary papers. My aunt, her husband, and another uncle from the United States sent us visas, sent us affidavits, um, and money for the ticket, or the ticket, I'm not sure, but my sister was the one who took care of absolutely everything. And then um, on the day she went to pick up the um, the uh, passport, yes. She um, left something, some of her papers at home. She had to go back and then come back, which only took about two hours. We lived about an hour away from Prague. And um, because of that, she couldn't come with us. She uh, came to the States six months later. Essentially, the way you described it to me, that 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 two hour gap when she went back cost about a thousand places in line, right? And that resulted in her not being able to come for six months after you did, right? right. Yeah, right. that's a that's a lovely photo of you and your sister taken after the war. Do you know, Ruth, how your father coped with such tragic losses, including his wife, his son? and his other family members. Do you know how he coped with that? He never talked to me about anything other than telling me, I remember walking with him someplace and he was telling me how much he missed my mother, my brother, his mother, and all his sisters and brothers. And that's all he ever told me, nothing else. I knew we knew he was suffering, but he just did not talk. Ruth, I have just one last question for you today, and that is, as we face an alarming rise in anti-Semitism around the world, as well as Holocaust denial and distortion, please tell us what we can learn from what you experienced during the Holocaust. Uh, whatever I talked about now is um, all about anti-Semitism, about the terrible things that we Jews had to suffer. And um, I certainly hope that we are not going to ever have to, we or anyone else, will ever have to suffer that again. I um, like to convey my message to people to uh, learn all they can about the past, the Holocaust, and prior to that, what led up to it. Um, first thing started slowly, and then they ended up going faster and faster. 
and um, it was quite a life that I think we all had to work to change. So again, we have to learn about it. We have to not permit anything like this to happen. I don't know with what means, but we just have to. Ruth, thank you so much for being our first person today. We are extraordinarily privileged to have you share, not only with us, but with everybody you share, what you experienced and the lessons that we must remember, we must learn. Uh, we are so grateful to you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you. I'd like to take a moment to thank our donor. First person is made possible through generous support from the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. Next week, our museum will commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which makes the liberation, which marks the liberation of Auschwitz. Visit ushmm.org backslash IHRD for information and resources on how to join us in honoring the 6 million Jewish victims of the Holocaust and millions of other victims of Nazism. Thank you for watching today. We look forward to sharing another first person program with you next month.